Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Marcus Aurelius, and this is Mountain Blade Warband, Anno 1257. And let me catch you up as to where we are. We are outside the gates of Tripoli. We are at war with the Mamluk Sultanate. The war has been going pretty well, mainly because I'm the one who's been in charge of it. I didn't want the war, but when it was declared on us, I had nothing else to do but persecute it to the best of my ability. I have conquered Aleppo, I have conquered the Crac de Chevalier, and I have conquered Nicosia for the Roman Empire. Before we get, however, to where we are, let me tell you where we've been. We had a situation where we were fighting the Golden Horde, and we were doing quite well against them. Well, all of that fell to ruin because the Mamluks declared war on us. So, I was at a point where I had to fight a two-front war, which the engine of this game is not very good at. You can tell lords to go and patrol a certain place, but they don't always listen. They run away, they do other things, they get killed. Who knows? So I was racing back and forth between one front and the other, and I wasn't doing particularly well on either of them. Noticeably, what happened was the Golden Horde was able to take Tirgaviste back, and we have not, as of yet, been able to take it from them. We are currently at peace with them, though, and I hope we stay that way for quite some time. However, there was an amazing culmination of moments that I kind of wish I could film, which could have filmed, but it's nothing that you haven't already seen. However, I was around here, by myself, after letting the armies home. And I noticed that Varad was under siege by the Golden Horde. And the only person in Varad was the lord who currently owns it. I believe it was one of the, the Dukas. There's Ioannis Dukas, and then there's the other Dukas, one of them. And so I went in there with my personal unit, and it was a force of maybe 500 Golden Horde, and we had about 300... And once I was defending the city, I got a notice that Ankara was under attack by the Mamluks. And I had a choice. I could go back and I could save Ankara, or I could live up to my reputation as an honorable man and as marshal and stand side by side with my fellow lord and defeat the people who were trying to take over Varad. So, of course, that's what I did. And we fought off the Golden Horde, and we wounded them so badly that they soon asked for peace, which we gave them. So Varad remains in Roman hands. The Lord, of course, didn't even say thank you, but the people of the city did, which was great. So we come to Ankara. Ankara was under siege by the entire Mamluk force. It was a mess. There were something like... 1,250 of them. Ankara, if you'll recall, I left with a token garrison of about 150 men, and not particularly good ones. Well, by the time I made it to Ankara, the fight had already begun, and the men defending it had whittled down to about 50. So they, plus the 150 to 200 men that I had on me, I was able to sneak through the battle lines were all that was left to defend the city against 1,200 Mamluks. It was like my 300 moment, my Thermopylae. The Mamluks just kept coming and coming and coming, and we just kept fighting them off the walls. We backed up, we moved forward. At the end of the day, we were destroyed to a man. However, we took out nearly a 1,000 of the Mamluks. I mean, we just broke them right then and there. So I ended up managing to get out of the city. I had to pay the leader of the Mamluks 500 gold, and I was able to get out of the city with about five or so men. And I immediately went to Sardis Castle, Chonai. I refilled some troops. I raised up another army, and I went and took Ankara right back. It was, of course, awarded back to me. Unfortunately... By doing so, I had to take over the garrison again, and now the people hate me again, which drives me nuts, but it is what it is. So then, 
because of this brazen act of villainy, I decided to raise the banners, and I have been basically just kicking the crap out of the Mamluks ever since then. However, I don't really want to press the attack any further than Tripoli, because it leaves the Ilkhanate free and relatively strong in my back, and it just makes more sense to make peace with the Mamluks, go to war with the Ilkhanate, take all of this, and then we have a unified frontier. The Mamluks don't seem smart enough to go around me, so this is a good place for me to be, because it will basically allow me to stop any incoming army so that all of these cities, like Nicosia, Aleppo, and the Crack de Chevalier, that don't have much of a garrison, and basically the only garrison they do have is the one that I gave them. Every time I conquered these places, I basically turned over the garrison, I turned over all the prisoners that I had got that were not cavalry to the garrison. So for example, Crack de Chevalier, which is the only one that we can see right now, has about 64 troops. And there's some cavalry in there, but they're Muslim cavalry. Not that that's good or bad, but I can only have two religions in my party without morale problems. And right now I choose Catholic and Orthodox. Aleppo, I don't know what's in there guarding it, and Nicosia, neither do I. But both Aleppo and Nicosia, just so you know, I haven't shown them to you, maybe later I will, they are beautiful cities. Now, I don't know about Nicosia, it's huge, humongous, the, the battle map is ridiculous. But Aleppo, I was just playing around on Google Maps recently, and I went to Aleppo, and there is a fortress in the middle of Aleppo, and it is identical to the one in this game. So that's amazing. Whoever made this mod, or one of the mod makers, created a model of the fortress at the heart of Aleppo, which is, I mean, you walk up, it's this little bridge over this deep pit, going to the main building. It's fantastic. I mean, having fought there in this game so many times, I was amazed that the real-life version looked very much like what I've been playing on. All right. And that is not the only change that has taken place, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, no. I have learned many things since our last episode, and I have respect everybody, including Marcus. So let's get into it. Marcus, first let me explain to you what the rationale was behind the respecting. I thought that when something was a party skill, like tactics or tracking, that what that meant was the whole party contributed to it. So, if two people had four tactics, I thought that meant that as a party, you had eight tactics, right? So I was giving a little bit of this and a little bit of that to everyone, but that's not how it works at all. What a party skill is, is it's a skill that affects the whole party, but only the person who has the highest amount of it matters. So, what I decided to do was just specialize people based on the stats that were the most important to them. Marcus being the hardest because really he's me. He's my representation on the battlefield and he has to be pretty much good at everything. But the thing he has to be most good at is charisma. So I made him the official trade person because trade is a charisma based skill as is prisoner management, as is leadership. So those skills I maxed out and I took away his skill in everything else except for trainer. He does have wound treatment and surgery, but those are from books in his inventory. Those are not natural skills. Obviously, the leader skills I kept, inventory management and personal and leader skills I kept. And I used those points that I gained by taking away all these other skills, like tactics, for example, and I put them into his martial abilities so he'll be longer lived on the battlefield. So hopefully the newer, leaner, more specialized Marcus will be a much better avatar for the remainder of this campaign. I might have gone a little overboard and given him a bit more than he should have at this point, but it isn't egregious, and really, he's just one man. So what possible harm could it cause? Plus, he's Marcus Aurelius. I mean, come on. All right, but here's where things get fun. Ladies and gentlemen, here is where things get really fun. Let me introduce you to my Oi Koi. Now, you may have been watching this series for a while. You may not have, so let me elaborate. 
In I believe episode 5, I explained how I was going to work my story into the game mechanics of Warband. And I found that around this time period, the Byzantine armies, or the Nicene armies, that were not mercenary based, were based on small and large landholders, known as pro-noirs. Some of these pro-noirs were basically aristocracy, and they owned large tracts of land, and they were actually part of the reason for the fall of the empire, honestly, because the empire was based on an effective military of small land owners, and instead these magnates bought all the land, made the people work on it, and as a result, the empire had to mostly focus on untrained troops and mercenaries. And we can all see where that went. But either way, the large landholding pro-noirs were referred to as dinatoi, like magnates. And that is what Marcus Aurelius is. Although at this point in the campaign, owning Constantinople and a number of properties, he has gone far beyond a large magnate. He is one of the highest ranking people in the empire. But these dinatoi had war bands, or so you would call them. They're retainers and they're mercenaries, their own personal mercenaries, and they were referred to as the oiketai. And along with their oiketai, they had a group of close friends and family members known as their oikeoi, which were like their elite kind of personal guards and companions. And so these are my oikeoi. I have split my oikeoi up into two factions. There's the warrior oikeoi, who are basically, that's exactly what they are. They fight on the battlefield, they protect Marcus, they're elite warriors, and I refer to them as oikeoi. Later down on the troop list, I have a support group. They are also oikeoi, but to make it easier to command them on the battlefield, I refer to them as support. So we're starting off with Rick Khan. Rick Khan is one of the Oikeoi, and he is pretty badass, but let's talk about Rick. Rick has a lot of strength, not as much agility. He is maxed out in all of the martial traits that he needs to be, and he's also a trainer. Everyone's a trainer of some degree or other, and if they originally came with leadership, I kept the leadership on them, even though unless I start my own kingdom and give out lands, it's really irrelevant. But I figured, you know, if they started with it, why not? So that's Rick Khan. And everyone, just so you're aware, everyone is specced the same. They are all meant to be melee troops on armored horses that are skilled in one-handed weapons and pole arms. None of them have any appreciable skill in ranged attack, except for the support guys, of course, who are the opposite. But the, the main warrior oikeoi are melee and pole arms. And I may decide later to spec some of them out as double-handed weapon users just for fun, but I would need better armor for them in order to do that. So then we have Garrett Valkyring. And by the way, these names come from people who have commented the most in the channel for this particular series. Now, a lot of people have commented, but these guys have done more than average. They've commented multiple times, they've followed the series since the beginning, and I want to kind of reward them for that. So that's why they are my OIKOI. So there's Garrett Valkyrie, he's very similar to Rick Khan, and Ost Saint. Now, these three were my initial three companions, so they are stronger and more powerful at this point than the rest. But I love everyone the same. In fact, I just gave names out kind of as they came. I didn't have any thought as to who was the Catholic, who was the Orthodox, who was the Muslim. So in real life, you know, you might be Orthodox and I might have given you one of the Catholic or Muslim guys. Just don't even worry about it. In this game, it doesn't even matter because once you actually hire them, the religion is meaningless because they don't affect your troops. You never really find out anywhere. So they're all the same. They're all Marcus Aureliusin. That's what they are. <laughs> So then we have Dave Nunya Business, the Danny Boy, and Anti Scamp. Anti Scamp needs a better horse. Martin D. Peterson, Arcade Knight, 
By the way, Arcade Knight is not necessarily a commenter, but he is another LPer who's doing a really great series of Mountain Blade on the Kingdom of England. Actually, he's completed it. He does a lot of series on different Mountain Blade mods, and if you're interested in Mountain Blade Warband and the different mods thereof, I highly recommend you give his channel a look. We have similarities, but we have differences. He is a lot more passionate than I am in his commentary. And he role plays a bit more than I do. So he is his character. He screams in anguish at his character's defeat, and he cheers at his character's success, and he motivates his men on the battlefield. Whereas I'm more of a kind of historian who's is Marcus Aurelius, but is narrating from above, kind of. So it's a completely different take on it, and I've watched his entire series of England. I think it's fantastic, and I don't have hardly any time to watch series, so that's, that's a big deal for me. But I've learned a lot from it, I've enjoyed it, and I recommend it. So that's Arcade Night. And then there is Eli Odom. So moving down to our support Oikeoi, we have Just Riak, who, and I'll actually show you each of these guys individually because they all have different skills. So Just Riak is, and by the way, if I'm pronouncing any of these names wrong, let me know in the comments and I'll fix it, but he is our tracker. He is skilled in pathfinding, spotting, and where is the rest? Uh, looting. Looting? Okay, he's our tracker and our looter, apparently. And uh, he's, I think he's our best looter, so we're going to have to improve that on him when he levels up because we need better looting than that. But anyway, so that's his role. He's our main tracker. And of course, by making these guys specialized, I've been able to upgrade all of their martial abilities. So now these guys are still really good at ranged, but they're also strong and good at other things as well. So then we have Mortal Deval. Now, Mortal Deval is not necessarily a commenter either, but he's just someone who in the forums of Anno 1257 has given me a lot of advice and tips and has answered some questions that I had. So I appreciate that and I wanted to thank him. So that's Mortal Deval. And he is... Who is he? He is our engineer. He has a six in engineering, and, oh, he's our engineer and our tactician, and that's a big deal. Basically, he needs to be alive at the beginning of every battle because he provides our tactical bonus and he breaks down the walls. Once the battle starts, if he were to get knocked out, that's okay, unlike, say, a doctor. So he's more of a guy we need definitely standing at the beginning of the battle, but I've toughened him up quite a bit, so he should survive longer than, than typically. Next we have Janner919. Janner needs a better horse as well. A lot of these guys need better horses. And now they can have them because I was able to respect them. So Janner is... He's our looter. He's a better looter. He is also our tactician as well. So I guess you could say that Janner is the main tactician looter. And Mortal Deval is an engineer primarily, but he is our backup tactician. Because if one of these guys were to get knocked out, or if we go from one battle to another and one of them's not participating, we're still going to want somebody to have it. So I have backups on everything. Then we have 965 Ferrari. 965 Ferrari is our doctor. He's our main doctor, so he has a 6 in wound treatment, surgery, and first aid. Everybody has training, as I said, and his martial skills are a little bit worse than average simply because I've had to focus so much on his doctoring, which is the number one key here. But eventually I do want to get all this stuff up to 4, especially the horse. So I'm going to need to take him to 12 strength and 12 agility, which, it just, gosh, that sucks because... You really want intelligence to go up. But he is only level 22, so he definitely has like a good 10 more levels to go before it starts getting ridiculously hard to gain levels. So we'll be able to work him up pretty well. And then finally, we have the one unnamed guy, Nestor. You remember Nestor. He's the Keanu Reeves guy. He is our backup 
doctor, so he's not quite as good at doctoring. And he is also our backup pathfinder and spotter, so he's not so good at that and tracker. And as a result, his martial skills, again, aren't as good either. I may decide at some point to name Nestor after somebody, but I just, I really looked through all the comments of all the videos, and there's a whole ton of people who commented like once or twice, and I, I really don't want to pick one out of the whole group. But these guys that I have named have commented multiple times or have done things that have been really helpful to me in this campaign, which is why they received that honor. So I want to say thank you to all these guys. I appreciate everything you've done. I appreciate you following the series. I appreciate you being a part of it in the comments. I expect great things from all of you on the battlefield, just so you know. It appears that we have run out of time, so the Siege of Tripoli will take place in the next episode. Once again, I am Marcus Aurelius. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good one.